Good evening. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Evan Tuplitz, Vice President of Detroit Dramatic Concerts, and here with me tonight is a very special man. Emil Nalmoff is a pianist, composer, improviser, educator, and all around very, very nice person. And for those of you who do not know, he has played here on our series, and we are welcoming him back a second time. So, thank you. Except it was over three decades ago. <laughs> That's actually when we met. I can't see anything with my glasses. Uh, that's when we met, like 35 years ago, when you did your American debut. Correct. And he's even nicer now. But one of the things that is so unique about you, Emil, is the fact that you really come from a very special tradition, a tradition of teacher, student, mentor, that you've continued to pass on at Indiana University at the Jacobs School. And Emil teaches many fine pianists. And you are the last, as you call it, disciple of the famous, famous Nadia Boulanger, who really influenced, if I'm wrong, tell me, but. I believe that she pretty much was the major, one of the major influences on 20th century classical musicians, from conductors to pianists to composers to people like Bert Bacharach, Neil Sedaka, many different people. Tell me about the relationship in terms of what she did for you musically, in two words. <laughs> I'm peeling the orange, <laughs> which is how she described in an article in a newspaper her teaching on me. I'm peeling the orange. So that was also connected to um, the fact that she treated me not as a child who I was, but as a musician who I was promising to become. And there was no uh, excuses because I'm a child, nor bragging because I was a child. In fact, the whole idea of being a child was erased. It was all responsibility towards the gift which I received from God and that I had to pass to um, others. And that without vacation, without any other option than to be tolerant with the others and without any sense of um, forgiving for myself. And it's easier to do that around, to be critical of everybody and always find excuses for oneself. But already then she taught me that. Another thing she taught me in music that was very interesting about the fact that I was a child, I was seven, she was 84 was that she taught me in the uh, discipline of uh, music making that the rules are to liberate yourself from them. And she taught me the difference between forbidden and tolerated in the harmony book. Explain that. Well, I didn't know how she explained it to me as a child. <laughs> but since I was composing already since always, she uh, allowed my composition to develop freely while she was using the academic side of theory, music, harmony, contrapoint, fugue, solfege, and all these, without any sense of easy paths. But for composition, I could do all the rules I was breaking all the rules that I was respecting in the exercise in harmony. So there was no confusion between in creativity you free yourself and in order to free yourself you have to learn how to be disciplined. 
And so that was one. The other thing was the attention. She was always thinking that we don't pay attention enough. But really, for instance, uh, her keyboard harmony class was a very interesting moment because none of us were all pianists. Some of them are conductors, some of them are theory students. And she insisted on keyboard harmony to be produced patterns in every tonality. And because of the technology of the 70s, which was the audio cassette, as not very modern, she obliged us to record ourselves playing 30 minutes one side, a given sequence, naming in which key we are and keep our attention on it while it goes forever and ever, and never do it just reproducing it without, um, without to think about it. And I think that, um, I'll give you an example if I may. That's a piano, by the way. function of it, um, but it was to manage to keep always focused on what you do, even repetitively, and to acquire a constant attention and hearing, and not follow only fingers, memory, or another way of acquiring the music. And I think um, that was the second aspect. The third aspect was the sheer emotion that music brings you. She would bring me to the Louvre Museum and she would uh, show me paintings to observe um, the color usage of the painter in terms of um, background and um, there was um, a special series of peasants of the 17th century in France by Le Nain and they all are in this very gloomy um, farm and one of the characters in the painting holds a glass of red wine. And so she would cover it up with the program or something and say, go back and look at it in perspective with and without it. And she was explaining to me the meaning of an inharmonic modulation that is subtle but makes the whole difference of atmospheric change rather than just contrasting effect. When uh, the comparison to the colors of the painter's choice compared to the harmony sounds that I use. But what you're talking about for those of us who are not quite as musical is you're talking about essentially the harmonic colors yeah, changing. But also emotions. Which, which, which make emotions. And course. she would say music can mean so many things to us but after all it is only what it says itself. In other words, you can describe it, but it doesn't need really to be described other than the music itself talks to our psyche directly. Whichever way we receive it, sometimes we are more or less knowledgeable about it. But a harmony, a melody, a combination can, can bring us to become moved, as if somebody told us some message. And so she didn't disconnect music from its meaning or from its emotional aspect. It wasn't just becoming an idiot savant as a child that I could have become. It was the idea that um, we respect the texts, we bring them alive from the dead composer's works. And then we um, didn't work so much on interpretation because she didn't believe very much in interpretation. She believed in reading the meaning of the composer's intent. And for instance, um, she had her favorite pianists, though she was not 
giving examples of their performances. He was always on the score, you answer to what you read from what the composer suggested. And I find that to be very um, interesting because most of the times this is used in music schools separately. Like if you use music theory, musicology, and the performers perform and the theorists theorize and the musicologists think and write articles. So it's a little bit, of course, I sort of like make a little bit of a caricature, but let's say that the reason for which I wanted to, in, to, to answer you to this question with this way is because she sort of brought it all in one. And in so doing, what she was looking, I assume, which we don't get today in the same way. As an educator, you see young musicians every day at IU, and they oftentimes want to take the fast track and not necessarily learn what the composer thought and how the composer put the piece together. So very often I teach in a provocative way. Uh, I always teach the what if. Mm -hmm. And so if a decrescendo or a ritenuto in any indication is placed by a given publisher in a given spot of the score, or there is a decorative pattern, I say what if Beethoven didn't go in this but went this way? And I really give them examples how it could have been. I always think what if he died before the B section of yeah. this uh, piece? And, we try to guess what he would have written. And he always surprises us by writing either overly simple, either completely, completely crazy, outside of what his style is supposed to be. So if I write a cadenza like he wrote of his own concerto, they'll say, my God, this is not possible. He would have never written that. And so what happens with these examples is that I don't teach them not to respect the text. I, um, I bring them to, uh, to explore in order to play what is written with more meaning. I give an example for creative voice leadings that I do for them. Yeah. Uh, for instance, everybody knows Brahms' late uh, intermezzi. There is the number two from Opus 118. Do you mind again? I'm sorry. Of course. brought to her students, and when I say quality of listening is the horizontal layers, not the vertical combinations of chords or bar lines or downbeats. So I developed, um, because I was a child, it was virgin territory, so I absorbed this uh, way of listening to the music by layers. But and you improvise, Emil. You improvise every day. Well, many do. different pieces and upload it to your YouTube channel. But that's my inner garden. Yes, 
It's, and it's a beautiful thing. But what's interesting is how did your teacher's method of teaching influence and create this person who could freely extemporaneously think right. musically? First of all, she would have been furious with my improvisations. Really? Oh, yes. Why? She wanted me to avoid facility, as children easily do, by finding ways to bypass the tedious. She wanted me to write my thoughts, notate my thoughts, um, edit my thoughts, organize my thoughts, in other words, compose, extract, learn how to be when you improvise, it's like now, I really speak to you, but I really don't know what I'll say in the next sentence, but somehow we navigate. And if I read the text with the lines and I memorize them as an actor, then that's what I do when I play the music of others, right? Yeah. And so when you mentioned improvisation, she wanted me to avoid improvising because she thought I would, which is not difficult to guess, I would have got lost into just improvising all the time. It's like a faucet that never stops flowing. And um, she wanted me to organize my thoughts, to edit them, to write them down. And she insisted on that. So I started um, improvising relatively late compared to then. And I find it very liberating. I don't confuse the two idioms. I like, I, I adore composing, but it's more like a remote connection to the audience, but when I improvise or perform, it's right away. Well, tell us about the experience of your first piano concert. Mm. <laughs> so, when I was eight, I started writing a concerto, and she said, I don't want to hear it until you're ready with it, and then I'll invite Mr. Menuhin to conduct it. And so, when I was ten, we did the premiere with me on the piano, in the same program, she scheduled the Beethoven's first piano concerto, which is typical for children pianists, <laughs> which is true, yeah. especially without technique. And then uh, she didn't want there to be an intermission. So she asked while the musicians of the orchestra are having a cigarette break, that Medwin and I play a Brahms sonata during the intermission. And actually, she was quasi the only person in the hall during the intermission listening to us play the Brahms Sonata because the audience also was an intermission. So it was okay. very intense, yeah, well, they think, very intense experience. First of all, uh, this concerto was uh, written from my native Bulgarian um, subconscious uh, model exper expression of music. Because at that time, I didn't know much about Bartok or anybody, really, because I was just not knowing. I was playing childish pieces, you know, Du Vernois, Easy Sonatinas by Beethoven. And... Um, but what possessed you, at 10 years old, to want to compose? Oh, come on. The piano concert. It's obvious. <laughs> it's... Um, it's a necessity. And, and the, the, the advantage of this necessity, I'm sorry I interrupted you, was that my teacher did not stifle it while I had to learn all these academics. So this kind of very subtle balance that she tailor made for my teaching, uh, that, uh, teaching me, was very, um, I mean, I really understood very clearly, very early, that she was respecting me which is a very rare feeling, because you know how easy it is when you have a child prodigy to exploit it more than to teach it. Mm -hmm. Because it's sort of like rare and weird, <laughs> because you do things adults barely can do, but you don't know why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And my teacher didn't like that idea about the intuition overtaking the knowledge, but tried to keep both. So she let me develop the concerto and I copied the parts and everything. So after the performance, she told me a lot of critiques about the piece. And she told me, you're gonna fix them in the next piece. But she didn't um, 
let's say, burn the score of my concerto, saying this is terrible first try. She was uh, very... She started with that sentence, J'espère que tu sais que tu n'y es pour rien. I hope you're aware that you're not responsible for what happened last night at the premiere. It's like, what do you mean not responsible? At least for copying the parts I was, she wanted to always keep it down to very down-to-earth humility and not to... She was afraid that I would build up some kind of um, attitude. So the, really, the funny part about the concerto is that the Beethoven concerto was more difficult for me to play because um, in that concert, Menuhin conducted. He conducted the concerto in two, and I was invited by the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra Hall, in the hall of the famous hall, to play it. So I was naive. I was 10 and I thought, like, I still believed in Santa in a way. I thought all the conductors in the world had agreed on the tempi of Beethoven. <laughs> so I assumed naively that the German conductor in Berlin will conduct in the tempo of Menuhin in Paris a few weeks earlier, a month earlier. Oh no. So Herr Thomas Meyer started the concerto in four, which is almost twice slower than the first movement. So when you're a kid and you don't have much technique, you sort of, with musicianship, know how to sort of cover up your tracks. Yeah. And when the tempo is slower, all of a sudden the articulations of the 16th notes appear like all kinds of things you see when the sea recedes. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And basically it was, I cannot play evenly those 16th notes at this tempo. So I stood up next to the conductor and begged him to conduct it a bit faster. And tell a German musician something about German music, <laughs> forget it. Especially with a French accent. Well, I think it was more Bulgarian then, actually, at that point. But anyway, do it as it is, you're right. He looked at me with the famous disdain in the eyes. Who are you? And um, it was a very um, revealing experience because that's the day I understood that people don't read the same piece the same way everywhere. I, which I, of course, thought originally. I was born in a country that was very isolated from the rest of the world because it was behind the Iron Curtain, as Bulgaria. And my mother was Greek. My father was Macedonian, Bulgarian, for whatever that means. And uh, well, I know what it means, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. And um, my mother finished French nuns school. So she had a baccalaureate in French, she was Greek, my father in Bulgarian. And since my parents didn't want me to go to a kindergarten in Bulgaria, they kept me at home like, you know, an Easter egg. Faber, right, of course. Well, that was a bit too much for me then. But I was just a regular egg. And what happened is that I assumed, because they're very disciplined, that each of them have their own language, which they did. My father didn't speak to me but in Bulgarian, my mother but in French, my grandparents but in Greek. Mm. Well, well, my grandparents being my grandmother, not both. And so I assumed until almost age four or five that everybody in the world has their language. <laughs> and I only did first grade in public school in Bulgaria, and it was a big shock to realize that most people around speak Bulgarian. <laughs> I mean, I was so shocked. And that's, when I was 10, I was even more shocked that all the conductors don't agree on Beethoven Tempi. And <clears throat> it's, an anecdote, and it's an anecdotic thing, but in a way it was very traumatic because I realized that even more responsibility lies on the interpretation. But it's most important to give a youngster and a seasoned musician guidelines. And the information you got from your teacher, how does it express itself today with your teaching of young people who are learning well, 
to start out on a career in music? I am an ant, and she was the Eiffel Tower. So I'll never measure to her teaching. And I'll never measure to my father either, when you have a father like mine. So humility was not very difficult to impose on me, because I realized that I was among giants. But I must say that earlier I mentioned interpretation in Boulanger, in terms of her choices. There was a pianist she had an enormous weak spot for, is Dino Di Patti. And um, that was the rare occasion where she was eager to make me hear an interpretation, especially in Chopin waltzes, about the rubato. Everybody talks about it. Everybody thinks they know what it is, but I don't think they agree more about it either. And um, it comes back to the, to, to the uh, uh, essential point of her teaching, which is listen, hear, what do you hear? And uh, the pulse, as well as the layered voicing, as well as the harmony, as well as the awareness of the storytelling narration, and therefore, the meaning, not that an interpretation is interchangeable, like an outfit you buy for your doll as a child, and another outfit, or you make an old sock into, a, into an outfit, and Barbie all of a sudden looks different. It's not just superficial like that. It was to understand by yourself some of what it means, and not theorize it only, but apply it. And um, I was very um, honored when, in an unfortunate moment of my professional life, <clears throat> a record producer told me, these are your CDs, but we're going to break the other ones because of some corporate situation. In any way, Lipati wouldn't, do a career, wouldn't have a career today. And I looked at him and I said, he's the boss of this big record label, and I said, you just made me the greatest compliment and buried me at the same time. <laughs> and I think that um, Mademoiselle Boulanger, who was partly a teacher of Lipati, mm -hmm. together with Cortot and some others in Paris, um, kept for him a great admiration about his robot. And so she was, thinking that I should learn the tradition of what she thought was closest to what Chopin was playing, according to, um, well, she studied with Fauré, but Isidore Philippe, who was the piano teacher in the conservatory, studied with Georges Mathias, who studied with Chopin in 46, 47 in Paris. So there was this continuum through Fauré, through Chopin, and um, then she went to international competition juries while I was studying with her, and I was eager to hear what she'll say about who she heard. Mm -hmm. And this is before all our social media today where we know anything happened anywhere. That was not the case back then in the 70s. And she went to the Leeds competition and uh, she told me, I heard the pianist who did the most expressive silences in the opening of the Liszt Sonata by Pariah, who won that competition when she was in the jury. And um, she insisted on not trying to um, play to please, mm -hmm. even the teacher, or the jury, or the competition, or the whatever person you want to please, because after all, there is a level of seduction in every play. Shebok used to say, uh, seduce without love is, in piano playing, is a crime. Mm -hmm. And I like that idea that it has to be meaningful. And so very often, young musicians um, take something from somebody's performance, if they like it, and they try to just do it themselves. download it to their way of playing. Yeah. But it's not rooted in anything. It's rooted in it's rooted in uh, in imitation. Yeah. And um, 
When Nazir Boulanger was talking to me about the rebata of the party, is about the idea that there is a structure and at the same time there is freedom in the way you pace the phrasing, therefore the storytelling. Mm -hmm. And of course, I've never found two musicians agreeing on what is the good taste rubato in Chopin. Of course. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so when um, you have students uh, who compete in competitions, as a teacher, I always feel like in a situation where I have to prepare them for them to be the best of what they can do. But I know that they will be judged not for their qualities or individualities, but they will be judged for how much they blend with the others. Mm -hmm. So it comes down to a common denominator that is as low as the play clean. Mm -hmm. As an ultimate um, argument for a vote at the, in the jury. But playing clean is not always evocative. But I'm going to switch gears slightly and say that this specific program is truly an outgrowth of Mademoiselle Boulanger's concept of analyzing great music. And it led you to transcriptions and transcribing for more of a reason of analysis, I assume. Well, it was because during the... Um, so I had three lessons a week of three hours each, which was respectfully prepared for me with uh, one hour of, or more or less one hour, <coughs> of um, piano, one hour of theory, and one hour of composition. and. In that third hour, very often there was a book carefully written with a little Emile sign on a page. Usually it was a phone book. And it had the complete motets of this and that Renaissance musician in all the clefs. And it was an assisted sight reading class. Is that I sight read the piece she wanted me to discover and I commented while I discover it by sight reading it. Perhaps that's the unpeeling, unpeeling of the orange. And she would be delighted to see how it affects my psyche, my hearing, or my understanding. And she would not guide me to prepare me or to tell me you should love it because this or you should love less love it because that. She, she was leaving a certain free arbiter for me at the same time, she was very gently guiding my understanding. And during these times, I was the most happy in the lesson, because I wasn't afraid of a harmony mistake. I wasn't afraid I'll play a wrong note, since I'm sight reading it. The only rule in the sight reading with Mademoiselle Boulanger is you don't stop till the end of the piece and you count. You don't fix things on the spot. And so you can replay it after again, but you don't stop and start, you don't study. But in this program, if I ask, because we have a time constraint, because Do we? there is a certain pianist that has to come out and play a recital. Oh, I'll tell him. Yes. So um, the reason I mentioned this interpretation, all choices in analysis in the classes you asked for the transcription, is that the, the group class of my teacher that was on top of the three lessons a week was uh, officially called analysis. It didn't mean much that, actually. It was more like somewhere between um, musical enjoyment and uh, general education in music. But most of the pieces were not for piano. Most of the pieces were Bach cantatas, or orchestra pieces, or Mozart quintets with two violas, or Renaissance uh, motets in 8, 12, or 16 voices. So are you going to sing today the Foreign Requiem? No, I am only going to play it. But when I was... so. Most of her students were terrified in front of her because she had that scary look. And I wasn't, not because I was not realizing who she is, but because um, I was there all the time. <laughs> and it was easy to say, Emilio piano. So whatever we were doing, Emil was on the piano. And the rest of the students in the group would sing 
the parts. So I was transcribing, before I knew I was transcribing, I was just basically reading. That's the concept of the 19th century. I say, let's gather to read music. There's no rehearsal and no performance, just the reading itself. And so I developed this taste for playing on the piano pieces that are not for piano, because I was doing that since she didn't want to hear much recordings. She wanted us to experience it by ourselves. And most of her students didn't have pianistic skills around me at that time. They were more theorists or more composers or more conductors. So I was sort of the um, guinea pig on the piano, testing all these impossible scores sight reading. And she would be furious if I let the slightest wrong note in my sight reading be flat in the tenor or something. It's like, how come you don't pay attention? I remember one day I told her, but mademoiselle, this transposition of this forêt song makes me play it in C flat major. There's so many flats. They're more than the most amount. And she goes, that's not an excuse. And in fact, she left me without to uh, be kind to me in the sense of, 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 of being just a little sweet old grandma. Oh, good kid. No, it was terribly more uh, tough for me because of the situation in which I was placed. And I must say that these transcriptions after she died became my, um, not these specifically, but in general, playing on the piano, orchestral, organ, choral music, evocative, evocative to the piano transcription, was not uh, something I tried to do, it was something that I was doing all the time, compared to the fact that at that time I didn't play all the etudes by Chopin. But I played all the Prelude and Fugues by Bach very badly for only one reason, is that every week I had to learn one. Monday, Tuesday, it was copy by hand, no piano. Wednesday, Thursday, is write it from memory, no piano. And the Fugues in the Staffs with the clefs. Then Friday, Saturday, play from your own score. But that was tough because I could know them, I could solfege them, I could chew them, I could sing them, but I couldn't play them really. And the next week we started another one. And the, the circle was almost complete when, in her very late months, before she died, she was in a, on her deathbed, and I had this very weird thought that came to mind when I went to see her. But I said, don't you get bored? in bed, because she was so active. And she told me, no, because I tell myself, note by note, the well-tempered clavier's fugues, voice by voice. She couldn't read them because she was almost blind. She couldn't play them because she was in the bed. She was just solfeging them. And so she would solfege one, as we always used to do, and I would solfege another part, and would spend hours me holding her hand and solfeging back fugues without pitches, without tones, but we knew the pieces. And so it felt like the music was not just performed, it was also integrated. And so when I played the Requiem by Fauré, I was remembering the fact that she conducted it, also that we played it for her funeral. And then I started playing it on the piano, and it was very natural for me to do so. The publisher of the... Um, of the CD was terrified that the Forêt people <laughs> would sue him. And so I had to write a letter to his publisher in which I had to say, I, I'm, I'm not going to, I promise I'm going to distort the piece. And after 30 days, no answer, I agree. I accept the agreement, and that's what happened. But he was terrified. He thought, I'm going to be, you know. Of course, for some musicians who are purists, transcriptions are sort of like, not that pure. Or, you Like know. they're revelatory, because I use the example of, and I'm 
in the interest of time, because we don't have a lot of time. What time is it? 7.15. Oh, perfect. So, but in the then. interest of time, I wanted to see if anyone had a question for Maestro Namo. Any questions? Yes. Well, I'm wondering, because I'm thinking of the uh, tradition of transcription in people like this or Mussolini, and do you see what you're doing as different from what they were doing? The question is... Isn't it obvious? Yeah. They're giants and I'm an ant. <laughs> <laughs> so, also, I think Busoni and Liszt and all this tradition of the romantic piano, they played transcriptions in a way Mozart played his own music and was never asked to play where he went somewhere, something by, I don't know, Bach. They played their own music, and even if it was a transcription of somebody else's music, it was their way to convey it to the audience in those times where there was less obvious opportunity to hear the original piece. So the transcriptions had a utility as well as the charisma of the, of the pianist. And I find that uh, in Liszt especially, but also in Busoni, they don't only transcribe the paraphrase, they uh, retell it in their own words. And I think that um, the only time I, I, I went as far as doing that, and God forbid I received so many bullets, meant intellectually against me, is that I transcribed Mussorgsky's pictures into a piano concerto. But in order to do so, I introduced a new light motif in the piano part. So in a way, that was a paraphrase. And uh, of course, the purists were furious. But you played that with a little known Russian conductor. Yeah, he's actually was very disappointed in me because I don't drink. Exactly, a certain <laughs> chalice pack. Who is it? It was Tropovich. And we, we had the premiere under his uh, baton and his wish in 94 in um, uh, Washington, D.C. In the interest of truth, I think that a good transcription qualifies when, while you listen to it, you don't miss completely the original. That in, in some aspect, it brings something of another point of view to the piece without to try to um, imitate or... Um, for instance, it's obvious that I don't have three hands, but I have a middle pedal. <laughs> and so I take advantage of it. Um, in general, I think the idea of these transcriptions as an aesthetic um, oeuvre really is lying down with uh, a list for good. And uh, what I was doing was, I was outside of the Mussorgsky uh, project, I play the piece. And to the point to which I never notated it as a transcription. I was just playing the piece, and I thought, whoever wants to do it, I have to play the piece, meaning from the score. And it's only for, um, like, my CD producer at the time, for um, legal rights, that I had to notate it so he can prove that it existed, and that it was not me, let's say, using somebody else's. And um, I still think that the transcription is more like a glove, that fits a person, and then it doesn't fit another. And so, when I notate my music, I, my compositions, I try to be very precise because of the choices made. But um, in, interpret in, the, in the interpretation of a transcription, I find that every time I play the piece, it reveals itself in a different aspect according to the audience, the acoustic, the place. Not everything is defined. And so it's evolutionary, in, in evolution, I'm sorry. Yes. Maestro, I have to tell you, it is time, but... Where's the I maestro? <laughs> <laughs> this man, you watch him conduct himself. Anyway. Do I? No. But you that would be silly. But you play beautifully. And we look well, forward to hearing so. you, and I hope that you make me 
have learned something that Emil shared with you, and I can't thank you all enough for coming to the pre conference I'd like to take a second to thank Evan Tablitz because this invitation to play for you here was a beautiful horizon line towards which I was preparing and which naturally as concerts are will be ephemeral because at one point we'll all leave this room but I'll keep a dear memory nothing but of this meeting with you before and to thank Evan for this very, very heartfelt thank you for this invitation.